one thing that strikes me is really kind of resonant about the show is that there are so many viewpoints. There are multiple voices, there are multiple ways of looking at the world, there are multiple ways of understanding what art means to African American artists and to African American to African American audiences. Many of the artists in the show were profoundly influenced by the ideas of W.E.B. Du Bois, by Lynn Locke, Langston Hughes, Ralph Ellison, James, uh, James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, and so, so many others who have been the literary voices for the black community since really the 1920s and before. These people in some ways set the stage for what the artists did because mostly they come just slightly before the visual images. Um, they talked about racial pride. They talked about what the heritage of Africa means. And they talked particularly about how to negotiate the place of the individual in a sometimes conflicted, very often dual society. Some of the artists knew Martin Luther King and took activist roles in the civil rights movement. Others became involved in the, involved in the struggle for freedom in post-colonial Africa. Sometimes their ideas run parallel but sometimes they're really quite divergent. But it's through the lens of their individual perspectives that we can begin to understand something about their personal journeys and about the multi multivalent nature of Af the African American lived experience during one of the most contentious, but also one of the most fertile periods in the country's history. Van der Zee truly changed the way African Americans would be, viewed, would be viewed from really the 1920s forevermore. He made studio portraits and did vernacular photographs that, ex that recorded the exciting transitional time in the 1920s that was known as the New Negro Period or the Harlem Renaissance. He photographed celebrities, he photographed sports stars, <coughs> Joe Lewis, Florence Mills, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., um, Muhammad Ali, Bill Cosby, and many, many others. And he was the official photographer, literally the official photographer, for Marcus Garvey's United um, Universal Negro Improvement Association. So he took thousands and thousands of photographs at the conventions and at the demonstrations and at the marches that took place, particularly in the 20s. One New York Times critic actually observed that Van der Zee didn't just document the Harlem Renaissance, he helped create it. But we know nothing about who this young man is, this and portrait of a young man with a telephone. He's immaculately dressed in this three-piece suit and we understand that he's a modern man. This is a, a photograph that was taken in the late 20s. He could be a banker, he could be a blue collar worker, but the sharp crease in his trousers and the light reflected in the high polish of his shoes um, makes an image that speaks absolutely of success. The props are all Van der Zee's props. He had, you know, backdrops, he had studio, you know, furniture and vases of flowers and all that stuff. So that if um, someone wanted to have their picture taken. It was a process of identity formation. They could work with him to determine who it was they wanted to be, and he would take the picture. Alain Locke, as you all certainly know, was one of the most important spokespeople of the Harlem Renaissance. He was a Howard University philosophy professor, a thinker, a writer, um, and incredibly, incredibly influential. He wrote an essay titled The Legacy of the Ancestral Arts that was published in an anthology called The New Negro in 1925. The book had essays by a number of writers, not just by Locke, uh, but that celebrated black culture, black accomplishment, there was poetry, there was fiction. Um, Locke himself, though, talked about the emotional inheritance. Those are, that's a quote, those are his words. The emotional inheritance of African art for black Americans. And he called for a racial idiom based on precedence in African art. One of the illustrations in the book showed a mask that had the caption, Yabuba. I haven't figured out what that actually means. Um, but that mask reproduction, the illustration, bears a striking resemblance to the frontal pose and the high arching eyebrows of Sergeant Johnson's sculpture, just called Mask, that was created, we don't know exactly when, but sometime between about 1930 and about 1935. Johnson had read Locke's essay, and he'd certainly seen the illustration in the book. And the way he put it, he said he wanted to show, quote, the pure American Negro. He wanted to, pick, to depict, quote, the natural beauty and dignity in that characteristic look, that characteristic hair, bearing, and manner. These are 
has two self-portraits. Melvin Gray Johnson on the left. Johnson moved back and forth between exploring modernist composition, and he was certainly aware of Alfred Stieglitz and the kind of work that Stieglitz had been showing, and what came to be called racial art, that is, art that connected black life with its ancestral roots in Africa. The artist can present himself however he chooses, or she chooses. I mean, it's telling on the left that the masks and the painting in the background, see that painting on the wall in the background? That is one of Johnson's own paintings. Um, they're aligned with his face. By putting them there, he makes a declarative statement about his own African-American heritage. Lois Mayhew Jones, it's as though, it seems to me, that she's testing the idea of whether Africa was tied up with her identity of an artist. Well, Lois traveled a certain amount. She had a very distinguished career. Uh, but not until 1970, when she was 65, was she able to go to Africa for the first time. Um, she went, by the way, um, as part of um, USIA programs, government programs that were educational to tr bringing American culture to countries around the world. The trip was life-changing for her. She stopped doing the Impressionist work that she'd been making for decades. And instead, she began flattening forms and using unmodulated color to link her work with African art. This piece, called Moon Mask, has a paper mache replica of a white quale mask from Zaire at the center. Above it and below it are designs that she drew from Ethiopian textiles. When you look at the face, uh, it's hard to see in the slide, but in person upstairs, take a look at the face of the mask. There are golden tears that run down the cheeks of uh, just below the eyes. I can't help but think that for Lois, um, and her experiences in Africa in the 1970s. She put those tears there um, because she and the mask were weeping for the condition of contemporary African people in the struggle for freedom in this post-colonial era. Now, when we talk about Africa, we talk about, you know, the United States is an African diaspora country in many respects. Well, there are others as well. Tony Gleaton was a Vietnam veteran who left a promising career as a fashion photographer in New York. He worked for um, Her uh, London Vogue magazine. That was a big deal. But he decided it, it didn't count for enough. So he quit and hitchhiked through Nevada taking pictures of black cowboys. Well, he said it was a real awakening for him as a black American. So when the cowboys followed the rodeo circuit to Mexico, Tony went along. And what he found there, beyond you know, cowboys and horses, he found descendants of the colonial slave trade that were scattered in isolated villages all over the country, but particularly along the Pacific coast. And it, it bothered him because he said, even though they have a common history, every village had a different tale of how their ancestors arrived in Mexico. You know, it was kind of their origin stories. And they didn't know about each other, and they didn't know that they had any common bond. So he set out to find, set off to find out more. Well, Tony clocked something like 50,000 miles traveling around Mexico and Central America. Some of it he did on his bicycle. He's, you know, can you imagine riding thousands of miles on a bicycle? Um, but, and some of it was in this converted army ambulance that he rigged up to serve as a camper because there were all sorts of places where he went where there wasn't really any place to stay. But what he did was he traveled photographing people of African ancestry. He said he was looking both at the common elements among people but also at the disparities because he said in making us different, these dis disparities also bind us together in the human condition. He's really quite a remarkable individual. But one of the things that you should know is that Gleaton doesn't, like Van he doesn't simply record what he sees. He's not waiting for something to go by <laughs> and then snapping a picture. He said he wants to reveal the psychological and emotional relationships. So he makes adjustments in the dark room. Um, he says, again, <coughs> from Van what you see in a photograph is rarely what really is. So for the photograph on the left, the one called Hija Negra Flor Blanca, which means black, <coughs> white flower, he cropped a much larger image so he could focus on the face of the young woman here. But one of the things I find fascinating is, you know, normally when you do a close-up, you get an enhanced sense of intimacy 
but I'm not sure that that actually happens with this photograph. I'll leave that for you all to decide. You have a sense of a person who may be skeptical, um, who may be reserved in opening herself up to somebody you know, that she doesn't know. The African connection is particularly strong in the photograph on the right. Uiho de Yamaya, a son of Yamaya. Yamaya was a Yoruba goddess of, well, it's complicated, but basically you can describe her simply as a goddess of water. And so Tony had this young man um, swimming. And just as his head emerges from the water, he snaps the picture, brings it down, crops it down. So we see this young man as he's emerging from the ocean. Um, and one of the things that I find really telling about, the, about this picture is that with the title alone, Tony is reconnecting this boy with a heritage that he didn't even know he had. Before he did this, he did a whole group, many, many pieces that he called lynch fragments, which are um, disturbing, distressing pieces. So in this, he, he really turned, sort of turned a corner, an emotional corner. The sculpture commemorates the life of Oliver Tambo, who was president of the African National Congress um, for many years in exile. Um, but it was Tambo, along with Nelson Mandela, transformed the ANC, this is now back in the 40s, from sort of a splintered group with conflicted missions and conflicting missions into a truly activist organization that initially was a pacifist organization and then discovered at some point that you know, sit-downs, um, nonviolent strikes weren't working anymore. And so they became increasingly activist. Well, what Edwards has done here is he's welded an assortment of wrenches, there's steel rods, um, there's a shovel, there's a spear, and there are fragments of I-beams. Well, these things are all welded to this shallow disc that looks like really a modern version of an ancient shield. Everything that is here, they are all tools that have to do with planting, with building, with repairing, in other words, for making things whole. But, just in case, the spear remains sharp. It's put aside in this little cup-like form that's welded to the desk, uh, to the disc. So, but even though it's put aside, it's ready in case danger reemerges. In the 1930s, when Robert McNeil took these two pictures, the country was still in the throes of the Depression. Things were better than they had been in the early 30s, but we weren't there yet. Um, and of course, the Great Depression had a disproportionate negative impact on black workers. Well, in 1938, the Federal Writers Project, it was one of the many New Deal programs that was, that was at work, um, commissioned Robert McNeil, who was only 20, to do a series of photographs for a book they were planning called The Negro in Virginia. Um, the basic idea was that the book was going to dispel myths about slavery. It featured text by African American authors. It um, included interviews with former slaves. And it included photographs. Well, McNeil said he understood that they wanted a non-controversial product. He said they wanted pictures of people at work that would show the, soul, the people's soul and dignity but whether or not the people were working in you know, prestigious jobs or menial occupations. Well, it was, it was a pretty challenging assignment on multiple counts. First of all, he had just three and a half weeks to travel all, all through the state of Virginia and wrap up this assignment. Plus, you know, by 1938, the New Deal programs didn't have a lot of money, so he had a limited amount of film. He had to very carefully figure out what he was going to shape what he was going to shoot. A lot of his subjects, whether they were coal miners, string bean pickers, or railroad workers, were not proud of what they were doing. He said, it didn't matter that I was a black photographer. They didn't want their picture taken by anyone. Well, the picture on the left, it's called laborer, but what it is actually is a picture of a longshoreman. Um, you know, it's an image of waiting. It's not an image of work. Um, loading ships was occasional work. So the, the men who were stevedores, basically, would come down. They were not allowed on the docks um, until they were called for work. So they would sit in, you know, on the stoops, um, on benches, 
hang around outside the pier waiting for somebody to call them and tell them that they had a day's worth of work. Um, so that, that's what McNeil is showing us. He's showing this, us this man who was waiting. Now the photograph on the right is called Spring Planting and he actually in the title gave very specific information about where it was taken and when. Shows a farmer rolling the soil, rolling the soil between crops to prevent um, erosion from the wind. I've used this photograph so many times. Um, I love the low camera angle. And I love the fact that, you know, taken from below, the figure is backlighted. He's heroic. I mean, this is the man who raises crops that allows all of us to eat. Now, he is heroic. But notice the patches on the knees of his, of his jeans. Um, it is a powerful picture, but it's also somewhat of a conflicted picture. 